to Bookends Online, produced by the Wadena County Historical Society and Travelin Storyseller, in collaboration with the New York Mills Regional Cultural Center. Bookends is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a gr grant from the Five Wings Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Car Cultural Heritage Fund. Bookends programs from previous authors are now available on the website of the Wadena County Historical Society at www.wadenacountyhistory.org. Today's pro program will also be available on the website shortly. Next month's speaker will be R.J. Kern in his book, The Unchosen Ones. Next month's bookends will be held Saturday, March 12th, 2022. This month's book is called Bud's Jacket, An American Flyer Evades the Nazis in Occupied France. The authors and uh, speakers are Barbara Wojcik and her husband, Jim Wojcik. <laughs> During World War II, James Bud Wilchke and his fellow airman, Robert Neal, found themselves on a harrowing, desperate odyssey of escape and evasion through Nazi-occupied Europe. They had been shot down over France, but made it home safely thanks to many French citizen helpers. Bud's jacket is a true tale of adventure, courage, and determination. If you have questions for today's author, feel free to enter them through the chat. Now, let's welcome to Bookends Online Edition, Jim Wojcik. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Jim, why don't you start with telling us about how you and Barbara decided what led you to finding out about Bud's jacket? And from there, what, what led you to deciding that this would make a good book? All right. Well, my wife is the, the real visionary and, and researcher and, and the, the core of this story. And when she was a young woman, her father, who was a Navy veteran, uh, served on a destroyer. And his uh, stories about that are told about in another book, um, Tales from a Tin Can. But um, uh, her father had told her that uh, her Uncle Bud, uh, his brother-in-law, uh, had... Uh, an adventure during World War II in which he had traveled through France evading the Nazis after he'd been shot down. And my wife hadn't thought about it for many years. Um, it was just sort of a uh, story in passing. She wasn't really close to that family. The two families were not close together. Um, but she knew him and liked him and he had been kind to her and so she was interested, but you know there were other things. We were a uh, young family and uh, she was busy being a mom and working part-time and uh, taking care of things. So you know, on we went with life. And then uh, she, we moved to a town home uh, nearby um, after a few years. And she started a book club here in our little community. And uh, they read a book called The Nightingale. And in The Nightingale, there are uh, soldiers who escape over the Pyrenees Mountains. And so one of the other readers in the book club said, uh, you know, I, I love the book, but I don't think that happened. You know, the, the author made it up as, as authors often do. Um, and Barbara said, no, that's, that's actually something that happened to my uncle. And it, it sort of prompted her to go through her memory bank and think about like, what was it that my dad told me? And how did this all happen? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so she started to uh, uh, look things up. Uh, her dad wasn't around to ask more details about it anymore. Um, and neither was Bud. Um, but her cousin Jim, Jim Jr., um, lived in uh, a Chicago suburb, and she hadn't talked to him for a number of years, but 
she wrote to him and uh, said, uh, you know, I'm interested in learning about this. And uh, uh, so he invited us to visit them. We went down to his home, stayed overnight, and he had a large trove of information that his, his dad had put together. Uh, it, it, it included uh, photo albums and, and some other things. Um, and then uh, Jim Jr. also had his dad's jacket. And uh, so we were able to see that jacket. Um, well, this was pretty inspiring to Barbara and uh, she's always been a history buff and, and you know, she can tell you enormous amounts of information about uh, British kings and queens and history and different things. But she'd been interested in World War II and you know, I'd been sort of much more passive about that, that study. I, you know, was interested in some other things, but uh, she started to uh, develop ideas about, well, what was this? How did this happen? Um, how did Uncle Bud sort of come to go through this adventure? And uh, it, it sort of uh, stimulated in her a sort of scholarly effort that went on for years. And she, she sketched out um, the route that they took. And um, then uh, over time, she gathered documents. She hired a translator. Um, uh, she hired a researcher who worked um, uh, in the National Archives. And you know one thing would lead to another, would lead to another. Um, and this was always just sort of like, one of the most exciting things of, of her day. And then she would tell me about it. And, you know, it was just a, a real treat for both of us. Um, and then uh, over time, uh, she decided, well, maybe I should try to write about this. And so in the Twin Cities, there's a, a writing co-op called The Loft, you may have heard of. And so she attended a couple of courses of The Loft. And um, she started to write about it and sketch it out. And she gave it to people to read and got some coaching about it. And uh, one of the sort of meaningful ideas that they, they told her was, well, you're, you're going to write about this. You want people to be interested. So start with the crash was the, the counsel that she received. Uh, because there is this... Uh, just critical, deadly moment um, uh, in this in the story um, that sort of punctuated Bud's life and began this whole odyssey. Um, and then um, in 2014, my wife had a, a cancer diagnosis. She was treated for it. In 2017, we um, we thought, well, we're pretty good, you know. Let's let's go to France now. Follow follow up on this because she'd accumulated so many relationships and ideas and information, and so we took several of the Wilschkes with us, and we went to France, and we followed from the point where the the plane crashed uh, until the point where um, Bud and his uh, his co-escapee, uh, uh, Bob Neal, who was the radio operator in the plane, uh, wound up in a Spanish prison. And so, you know, we went to a ceremony uh, on May 8th in, in uh, Brittany. Uh, and May 8th is a very, very big deal in France. Um, uh, they celebrate uh, the, the liberation of the country. And so we were a part of a parade on, the, on uh, May 8th and we went to a, a breakfast at a little bar where the, uh, one of the local historians, uh, Armel Le Fluc, um, had uh, you know, an event for us. And then we marched in a parade to the center of this little town square. And we went to a ceremony at the Steel, which was a monument created by the local people and the, the country of France 
um, for this group of aviators. And there are many of them dotting the country. Uh, you know, they just have revered this um, uh, effort by America and by the allies to rescue them from Hitler. Um, so then from that point, we went to the place where Bud was first sheltered. And, you know, we just went from place to place to place everywhere we went uh, because Barbara had done her homework so thoroughly. Uh, there were mayors waiting to invite us to their little town halls and, and they would serve us these delicious little uh, cups of cider and this uh, little uh, sp special uh, cake that they make, Breton cake it's called. And we would just, you know, be celebrated as the Americans are here, you know, and it's, we didn't deserve it, but okay, you know, thank you. Um, it was delightful. It was just exciting. Um, and then um, at the end of the trip, we got to the prison, toured the prison. Um, it is now a historical uh, monument, but they don't talk much about the prison part. It's like, you know, this was, this was a, a, a military uh, uh, sort of like camp, a fortress. Yeah, it was a fortress really. Uh, and it's, it's on the Spanish side of the Pyrenees mountains and the French and the Spanish would fight over, you know, who gets this rock and who didn't. Um, and they built this big fortress and had thousands of horses there. And, you know, it was quite a place. But um, during the time that Bud was there and during the post-Franco times, it was a prison and, they, you know, it was a rotten place to be. Um, so uh, we toured that and then we trained back to Paris and flew back home and, you know, Barbara started thinking some more, and, you know, writing some more and on we went. Um, but she realized that she was again ill with breast cancer and over time, uh, you know, the, the treatments for that have been very tough on her. And so as, it, as the book developed, um, she needed some help. She asked me to help her. I said, I like to write, you know, this is a good thing. And I was kind of somewhat familiar with the story. And then I just, you know, went deeper in it with her. And, and uh, so we developed this. And then uh, as the draft evolved, she found a publisher, a local fellow um, who uh, helped us a great deal. And my former writing teacher from college days became our editor. And uh, so then you know, we've developed the book and, and it has now been you know, just a source of pleasure to other people. Um, were you able to meet anybody that knew them or are they all gone? Like when you were in Europe? Yes. Um, yeah, we were able to meet uh, some people who were children when they were there. And um, uh, the first farm family, um, one of the daughters was alive and uh, was at the event. We went to this farm and we saw where, uh, we saw the field where Bud crash landed into a fence um, and they took us to um, the home and the farm and we got to see where he was sheltered that evening and go into some of the outbuildings. These are beautiful. They're much patinaed stone buildings that, you know, the farmers there still use them for, you know, small farms. Um, you know, but when I would look at them, I think, well, you know, this is just beautiful to look at, but I don't, you know, I'm glad I'm not trying to earn a living on it. But, um, and then we walked through a little path, um, to the place where Bud and his radio man, Bob, were reunited because he had, his parachute had landed a little ways away. Mm -hmm. He was rescued by some other people. And then Bud and Bob were taken to a, a little place nearby on a little uh, peninsula. Uh, it's called Quiberon. And uh, Quiberon itself was a marvelous and interesting place. 
um, there's a, a, a stone building there, a, a military fortress there, um, where the Nazis, uh, because they were angry about some act of resistance, um, uh, stuffed a whole bunch of French people into a, a part of this building and killed them. And uh, uh, so then, uh, hang on a minute. Uh, and uh, we saw the, the place where Bud and Bob were sheltered while they recovered from their injuries. Um, and then another uh, one of the, the people that we met very early on um, was a, a little girl who'd been a, a part of the, uh, a family who had sheltered them next. And uh, uh, Bud and Bob spent a lot of nights out in the woods. They spent a lot of nights huddled in little ditches and stuff. And uh, one of these families, uh, the little girl of the family uh, had a communion dinner. And so they carried out into the darkness uh, so that they couldn't be seen. They carried uh, uh, food from their her communion dinner out to Bun and Bob and, and uh, let them have that. Um, and then there were a few other people that we did meet that, uh, uh, had met them, um, or their families had met them, um, and sort of like all the different places as we followed along, uh, we tried to have connections with anyone who was alive during that time or, or uh, whose parents had sheltered them. Um, we stayed in a, a manoir, a very nice place, it's now a b and &B. um, and uh, you know, the, the deepest level of this manoir had a, a basement that was a thousand years old, uh, but then the contemporary parts of it were, you know, a couple hundred years old. So it was just life. And the owner of that place uh, took care of us and fed us and you know made room for us. And and we traveled around. We saw where. Um, uh, various Nazi atrocities had happened um, uh, nearby this manoir. Um, there was an incident where uh, the Nazis had come over a bridge and had disguised their tanks with allied insignia and flags. And so then the resistance members came out and, and celebrated their arrival. And then they were all murdered because it was really Germans who had, you know, been doing this. Um, also in this uh, manoir, uh, the gardener had um, been uh, shot against the wall. And there's a little plaque there. So everywhere you go in France, it's just this rich, rich texture of, of history that, you know, you can tune into and, and research and, and celebrate. Um, so how's that? Um, when you, you said that, um, you started with the crash because you wanted to start with the stakes high, but how did you decide on the whole story arc and how you put the whole thing together? The, um, uh, the, the writing of the book went back and forth between Bud and Bob's odyssey and things that had happened to them earlier in their lives. And as we told the story, uh, we tried to have Bud and Bob do the narrative to say, well, you know, this was like my dad was a drunk and, and you know, my dad was gone uh, because he'd been burned up. That was Bob Neal's dad. Um, and so we tried to bring in the history of the time a little bit um, and the history of the families. Um, we had more, a lot more about um, about Bud, but uh, early on, Barbara was able to uh, make a connection with one of the daughters of Bob Neal, and they are now fast friends, and, and she had sent Barbara lots of information about her dad and the times, and uh, how her dad and her mom had met um, 
Bob uh, returned to Pro Providence, Rhode Island, and and uh, that's where he had grown up. And and uh, he went out with another buddy. They were um, they were in a parade, and then they went out that night to a, a local pub. Um, you know, we had to invent some of this. Of course, you can probably tell, you know, some of it's storytelling and as much as possible is history. Mm -hmm. So we imagine the conversations between these men and and how uh, Bob Neal met his future wife and both of them were kind of lonely and war buffeted people and, and they married and had children and then, you know, they didn't make it as a couple, but uh, we got to know about a little bit of this from his daughter. Um, and then, uh, you know, Barbara's uh, historical digging included local newspapers. She found uh, information about each and every of men of the flyers. Um, in a B-17, there are 10 people and uh, Bud and Bob survived. And then the pilot and the co-pilot survived and all the other people uh, died during the crash in one way or another. Um, so there, all those names are on the, the monument, the steel in that area. Um, but Barbara found through uh, genealogy resources, uh, ancestry.com and so on, um, more about those families, more about uh, what happened to the man. Uh, she contacted all the local newspapers. A lot of these people grew up in little towns in Minnesota and other places. Um, uh, here's another little delightful part of our experience. This is like an odyssey for us too. We went to uh, California to meet the family of the tail gunner, um, Henry Mitchell. And Henry Mitchell, as Barbara discovered through diligent digging, um, had Philippine ancestry. And so she wrote to his family and they said, you know, please come visit us. And so we had other things to do in Southern California also, and we went and visited them. Uh, and this was just one of those experiences that you, you would wish for. Uh, they had all the family members, you know, I don't know, 30 people probably come who, who lived in the area. They made us this feast of Philippine food, you know, and we were just like their heroes because uh, it was really only through Barbara that they got to know about what happened to their relative. Were you, so you were able to find a little bit out about everybody else that was on the plane? Yes, yes. And she would, Barbara sent uh, little notes to the local newspapers, you know, where these men had grown up and uh, sometimes got little recognition for them. Um, not always, but um, yep, we we know something about everybody. Cool. And you decided to focus on these two and, and the pilot and co-pilot you said survived also, but they weren't with these two when they escaped or? That's right. Yes. Um, the pilot and the co-pilot both were a little bit away and they were quickly captured by the Germans. And then they both were sent to uh, um, a POW camp. One of them had to be treated for his injuries for a little bit, and then he went to the same camp. Uh, and the, uh, the same camp had uh, been the place where there was the famous Great Escape story. Uh, and was it 13? Stalag Luft III. Um, and so uh, you can see the movie, The Great Escape, and you can see how these people uh, did their uh, tunnel digging and so on. And uh, uh, so Joe and Harry, uh, the co-pilot and pilot, were, um, were not a part of that that we know, but they were there in the place. And they told the story about, you know, camp life. Um, well, actually, um, Harry was not a, a, a big writer, 
but Joe Boyle was a, a great cartoonist and he wrote a, a kind of diary about it. And so Barbara was able to access that. Um, and uh, a, a master's thesis, a master's history thesis was written about Joe Boyle. And uh, so we were able to uh, read that. It's called War Eagles. And that information flowed into the book a little bit. Um, you know, we're always looking for historical foundations to, to tell the story. Um, and then uh, in a marvelous uh, uh, development, uh, Joe Boyle's, which niece. his niece made a wonderful movie about Joe Boyle um, and about another one of the men who was uh, a part of that, his, his life. And uh, so, you know, the, uh, the threads come from all over. Cool. <clears throat> and do you think there are any lessons that you learned that are in Bud's jacket that could be applied to events today? Because, you know, you see, I mean, I, World War II is one of my fields, um, well, German history and the Holocaust. And so, you know, when you see things happening today, you wonder, you know, what sort of lessons can we take from this? Sure. Uh, well, it is, it is one of the things that has impressed me so much is the vastness of the event, uh, cataclysmic event, and the way that people tried to think carefully about what is going on here? How can we resist this? How can we fight it? Um, and so, you know, leaving aside the, the way that Hitler was able to cast a spell on people um, and get people to do his bidding in so many ways. It, you know, the, the thing that we really focused on was how the, the French people, you know, in the beginning they were apparently stunned by how this all happened. And we've watched movies and read many books about um, uh, the, the process of how France kind of got to its knees and then got to its feet and you know fought back, um, and and that happened in ways big and small. Uh, so many heroic things. So many people were were murdered because they were discovered helping uh, our flyers and our soldiers, you know, survive and get back to uh, get back to fight again. Um, and, you know, all of these stories are really inspiring to us. Uh, it, it has been marvelous. Cool. And um, well, no. yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you were going to say something. Well, I, I guess, you know, leaving aside, you know, contemporary events, you just hope that we all have the courage to do that if we're ever called that. Yeah, I always found it interesting how there was a whole, whole underground that helps people move from place to place. Yes. Yes, and, and you know, uh, surveillance then was not what it would be today. Right. <laughs> fortunately for all of them. But it was intense. And, and so to get away with anything, you had to have your wits about you all the time. You had to be lucky. Um, and uh, so Bud and Bob were helped by all these people who, you know, in their little farms and villages and towns and cities uh, were looking for ways to resist and to fight back. Um, and uh, so we, we got to learn about so many courageous people. Well, yeah, it was, you know, while there wasn't the surveillance, you also had, had to worry about neighbors and family members they would not know everything about everybody. Sometimes you wouldn't even know that your spouse was helping in the resistance, at least in some places, because people were trying to keep it secret. Absolutely right, yes. And uh, in France, there are a number of museums that one can go to uh, that uh, displayed to us some of the ways that people hid the flyers and so on, you know, in false walls and so on. Um, and so amazing stuff, very clever, you know, very innovative, uh, 
uh, efforts to, to make this possible. Cool. Um, would it be possible to have you read a little bit from the book for us? We love to hear the, the readings. I'll do my best for you. Okay, thank you. I have just a couple of paragraphs that I thought wouldn't be uh, too difficult to read and uh, kind of take us into the plane and into the crash. Looking up from his vantage point in the nose of the plane, Bud could see that their fort, it's what they called Super Fortress B-17 planes, had fallen behind and dropped about a thousand feet below the group, but Indiary, the pilot, still showed no signs of turning back. They were now outside of the protection of the bomber formation and easier pickings for a fighter attack. Now, they sent over B-17s in groups and they were very scientific about how they designed this. And so uh, every B-17 was well armed um, and they tried to make sure that um, when fighters would try to attack them, there would be a wall of fire going back at the fighters to, to defend them. And so if you fell out of that formation, you were much easier to, to attack and to, to damage. So they were a thousand, they were at the end of the, the formation in the beginning because they had other problems and then their engine wasn't working and so they couldn't keep up and then they couldn't keep high enough. And so they were vulnerable. But Indiary still showed no signs of turning back. They were now outside the protection of the bomber formation and easier pickings for a fighter attack. He knew this was Indiary's first time in the pilot seat and silently cursed him for taking chances with the crew. Bud probably never said a dirty word in his life, but he was mad. <laughs> Why the heck are we still trying to complete the mission? We're sitting ducks. Let's live to fight another day. Another report came over the intercom, the droll voice of tail gunner Henry Mitchell. Henry Mitchell was the Philippine family that welcomed us. Bogies, no, bandits, three o'clock high. Then more urgently from waist gunner Dennis Cullinan, Bogies, nine o'clock high. Cullinan was seeing a squadron of German Focke Wolf 190 fighter planes quickly closing in from the left, but Mitchell had seen another group of 190s boring in from the right. The FW 190s, fastest fighters of the time, could fire 900 rounds a minute from machine guns and another 450 rounds from the even more deadly cannons, shooting explosive rounds that could burst a plane apart. The first machine guns strafed the fortress. The enemy fighters backed away and backed off, banked away and backed off briefly while flak from anti-aircraft guns below shook the B-17, shockwaves flexing the great seams of the wingspan until it seemed certain to rip apart. So a B-17 was a big aircraft of the time and here they were being attacked from the, from the ground, from the air, and uh, things were bad things were gonna start to happen in a little while. But the bombs were gone very soon, and we don't know if Bud hit the target or not, um, but you know he got them off, and then the, the plane started to be attacked even deeper, and it started on fire, and so they, they had to bail out. enough if, if that's all you want yeah i mean we love listening so anything you wanted to <laughs> well yeah i could read a little more if you want sure. with the bombs away bud grabbed his own twin machine guns took aim and shot back at the swarming FW-190s as flak burst all around. No time to think, his training took over, though his heart felt like it would pound out from his chest. Machine gun shell casings flew through the air and covered the floor. The air in the plane was hot and thick with choking smoke. The fort jumped and shuddered 
as more flak bursts sent shrapnel slicing through the plane. Fragments bounced off the armor plate of the pilot's chairs and whizzed through the cabins. So the pilots had a little extra armor plating because, you know, you lose them and what's going to happen. Um, and so the pilot and co-pilot co were protected by that. Uh, where was it? Okay. Numbing wind blew through the jagged gaps in the plane as the crew fought on for their lives. The fatal blows came in a flash. Enemy rounds tore through the control system lines. Hydraulic fluids gushed from shredded hoses and caught fire. And the cramped inside of the plane was suddenly ablaze. Oxygen lines ripped open. And like a welding torch, the flames were instantly hot enough to melt the plane itself. The airmen now had only seconds before they would pass out from lack of oxygen. Their fire extinguishers were useless in the blaze. Control systems now destroyed, the pilots struggled to keep the plane out of a spin, which would pin the flyers helpless against the fuselage as it crashed to earth. So this would happen sometimes. If pilots couldn't control the plane, it would start to spin and the centrifugal force would just push everybody against the wall. They couldn't move and they were there until it hit the ground. The remaining engines were billowing smoke. The intercom was dead. The noise was deafening. Gunning for the enemy fighters, Bud couldn't tell what was happening in the rest of the plane. Thick smoke and fumes poured into the nose cone as the bailout bell shrieked. So the, the bombardier was in the nose of the airplane and there was a plexiglass uh, cone that he was able to look through and watch everything. And then he used his Nord Norden bombsight to drop but this was also a very vulnerable thing because um, the fighters, the Germans would know, you know, you got to go for that guy right in the front too. He was easy pickings. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, flyers were killed from that. Choking and fighting for breath, the crew struggled not to get burned, but already knew what to do. Out of, pl out of the plane now, bud. He grabbed his chute, snapped it on the harness around his bomber jacket, crouched down to escape the crouched down to the escape hatch beneath him and underneath the cockpit and cockpit and kicked it open, exposing the rushing sea far below. This was Bud's first jump. Practice parachute jumps during training in the States were too dangerous and airmen too precious. He peered through the hatch at the shimmering blue waters of the Bay of Biscay and could make out the French coast in the distance. I'll read one more paragraph here. Roy Richards, flight navigator and Bud's friend from training squeezed past and motioned that he was going up to the nose to get something. Over the roar of engines, howling wind, searing bullets, constant explosions, the raging fire and deadly fumes, Bud didn't know what Roy had said, but he couldn't wait to find out. At 27,000 feet, with the air temperature about 35 below, it was time to hit the silk. His heart pounding, Bud jumped through the open hatch as if he had just leaped from a diving board at home in Illinois. With his jacket and chewed on, the hatch was just big enough to let him drop through. He slammed into the turbulent slipstream rushing below and instantly was swept behind the doomed plane. It was fun to write that. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Did all of the men get out of the plane? Or... No, only four. So only four got out of the plane and everybody stuck in the plane to make it. Yeah, some were, um, some were hit by the machine gun fire and you know, we don't know what happened to some of the other ones. No. Yeah, I understand that there was different positions all over the plane for the different airmen. Yes. Yeah. In the book, you'll see there's a, a diagram with each airman's position uh, labeled. So you can kind of see how, how they all worked together, fought together, 
and often die together. That was lucky they made it onto land though and not into the water. Yes, he had to work pretty hard to get over land. Um, and uh, fortunately the wind was blowing in the right direction and, and he knew just enough to kind of uh, control the, the parachute a little bit. And then he hit a fence, um, which we didn't get to see because the fence, the, the field was changed now. Mm -hmm. And there were trees that in the ensuing many years had grown up around the, the, the field. So it looked a little different. Right. We got to be right there. And uh, uh, we learned about it from, uh, from Bud's story a little bit too, because um, uh, every airman after they, if they survived and if they got back to uh, their units, um, uh, military intelligence would interview them. And then they would uh, take notes and think like, what worked for these people? You know, what worked for this guy? And they would try and then coach the rest of the airmen who would be flying next you know, here's how you do it. Here's how you are likely to survive. And they evolved their little survival kits. Um, they gave them uh, silk uh, maps of France or wherever they were going because the silk wouldn't get ripped so easily and it would fold and unfold without damage. And okay. they could hide it very easily in their, in their uh, clothes or in their bomber jackets. And then... Uh, they had little compasses that were made out of magnetized steel and they, they, they could uh, create a compass with just a little pin and uh, they could figure out you know, how to maneuver. Um, hmm. They had a little food, a little chocolate, a little, uh, little money that they could pay the populace uh, to help them. Um, and so they all, you know, the military intelligence would always try to refine that to make sure that the next guys would survive more easily. And then they gave them instructions about what to do, how to get your wits about you again, um, and uh, how to interact with the, the local people so that uh, you'd be more likely to, um, to find friendly people. Um, and one of the things that uh, uh, happened to the guys, um, they were, they were Taught, they were taught not to ever go to a farmhouse that had radio antennas because that was likely to be a place where Germans were uh, uh, working. Um, and they, they went to one farmhouse that looked sufficiently safe early in their escape. And they knocked on the door and the farmer came out and uh, uh, the farmer was very afraid for them because he had Germans at his kitchen table just beyond the door. And so he quickly shooed them away and uh, uh, Bud and Bob went far away as they could get and then slept in a field that night, hoping that you know the Nazis that were in there didn't get too suspicious. And you know, it, it's another thing about human behavior that you see when you study this stuff. Germans uh, at one level were determined to kill everybody who was resisting them. And at another level, they too would be hypnotized by the sameness of every day. And so, you know, the, the resistance or the population could watch them and sort of realize when their attention was a little bit softer also. And then they could sneak away and, you know, do what they needed to do. Yeah, I read something um, from a German soldier after the war had said, you know, there was a lot of times where they wouldn't have put in as much effort if it wasn't for local people letting them know where people were hiding or who was resisting. Because, um, so, I mean, some of them were very much diehards and some of them were just like human beings who were like, why do extra work? <laughs> you yes. don't have to. <laughs> One of the great resources that Barbara and I have watched uh, for context didn't give us a lot of specific information for the book, um, but I would commend it to anyone who's interested in this time, um, is called The French Village. It's a French uh, TV series, and it follows a number of people through um, the first invasion of France 
um, until the, the final episode, and it goes through several seasons. The final episode has uh, people in relatively contemporary late 20th century times, you know, and they're now elderly and, and they're some of them reflecting back on what happened and you can see the scars in their souls of, you know, what had happened. But uh, uh, it is just a fabulous uh, story. Um, we had to pay for the series, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, a lot of money. Um, and it's beautifully produced and beautifully acted. Um, splendid thing to watch. Cool. Um, when the plane went down, were they being hunted right away? Did people know they survived? Or did they have a little bit of time when they landed to kind of get their bearings and start moving before the Germans figured out where they were? Yes, good question. Um, well, the Germans uh, knew how to watch for parachutes. And so Bud in particular, almost immediately, they were hunting for him and the, <clears throat> the farmer who helped him, um, Andre, uh, no, uh, Mather and Diabat, um, quickly hid his parachute so that that would be less likely to be found. And then he moved him into his, um, his shed and hid him under some uh, clover in a cart but then uh, uh, two local men who were you know, resisting also uh, came and met uh, Mather and Diabat and said, no, you gotta get him out of there. So they hid him quickly in um, a hedgerow and that way he made it through the afternoon while the Nazis were on Diabat's farm hunting. Um, and um, so we got to meet um, one of the children of that family who um, uh, was there when this was all happening. And as, as we understand it, that uh, child was, uh, had a gun pointed at her, probably a Luger pistol pointed at her by uh, an, a, the Nazi commander of that little unit or soldier, you know, maybe he was like a captain or something. Uh, and he said, you know, you tell us where, where the, that guy is or we're gonna kill your daughter. And sometimes they would do such a thing. But interestingly, often they would kill the men and they would send the children and the women to a camp where they would die slowly. Um, they thought they were being show us, I suppose. Yeah, and they could also get some free labor before they died. Yes, right. Probably, you know, sewing uniforms or something. Yeah. Um. I was just wondering if anybody else had any questions that they would like to ask. You can always put them in the chat if you don't want to ask them out loud. And <laughs> I can see if anybody put anything. So you call the book Bud's Jacket. Um, was there any significance about the jacket in the book or in this event or? Yes, yes. Um, well, bomber jackets were like a, a suit of armor for flyers. They were thick, they were warm, um, they wouldn't stop a bullet, but they would protect you from a lot of things. And, and uh, you know, when Bud landed, he had to give it up because, you know, it was also clear that, you know, if you were wearing that, you were an American. Right. Uh, or you were a flyer. Um, so, um, uh, Mather and Diabat uh, took Bud's clothes and gave him some farmer duds, you know, to, to make him sort of fit in. And off they went. And, you know, Bud sort of naturally assumed, well, that's the end of that thing. And, you know, probably didn't think uh, there was any way that he would ever see it again. And um, how attached to it he was on any given moment, you know, we weren't sure. Um, but at, uh, uh, in the 1980s, uh, Bud was now a, an older man. Uh, he, you know, been through a, a life in America and, you know, felt bad that he'd survived when his, his uh, fellow soldiers, fellow flyers had been killed. Um, and uh, his wife, Rosemary, 
who is uh, uh, related to my wife, um, said, well, let's, let's go back. And so she set up the trip, she set up the tour, and um, she uh, used uh, uh, one of the people who had helped him, who was a physician in, in France, uh, to kind of organize a, a little tour of some of the sites where Bud had been sheltered and protected. And when they went to uh, the, the town, the little village where Bud had crashed, crash landed in his parachute, um, he was in a, a cemetery and um, he wondered whether um, the soldier, I mean, I'm sorry, the farmer who had helped him was still alive. Well. He was, he was in the cemetery, he had died, but his son was there. And uh, so he asked, you know, I wonder if Andre is here and Andre was there and he took everyone to the farm. And then this is one of the amazing things about this. Still makes me emotional. I've talked about this for years and it just gets you. Uh, he, took the people from the cemetery to his home and welcomed, you know, Bud and Bud could see where he had been sheltered and so on. And he said, wait, and he goes in and brings out the jacket and gave it back to Bud. And that's why it still is in America. It's in America again, is that they had set it aside and the belief that someday he would return. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. You know, humans can be nasty, but we can be wonderful. Yeah. I think that's why that period in history is so interesting because of the extremes of human behavior, mm -hmm. you know? from the most evil to the most incredibly brave and selfless. Yeah, there's a nobility that makes things possible. Well, thank you for making it possible to tell that story. Uh, I think those are, those are good stories of the triumph of humans over the evil. <laughs> Yes. So good over evil, that good thing. And we coincidentally had a speaker last month uh, that involved a, a French citizen during the World War II who was uh, conscripted um, into the, he was like in a work camp, work camp. Yes. Where, so that, that's how he survived the, the war. Uh, and that was another very interesting uh, connection because the person who discovered that was, she was actually looking for a font or she saw his handwriting. And then she started to read more, learn more about it. At, and then she decided to find him. And so that's, that's a really interesting story. Too. Yes, so, we know that story. That is a wonderful story too. Yeah. So thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, thank, thank you for you. asking thank me. You. It's been a pleasure. Yes, thank you very much for coming. And hopefully someday we'll all be able to gather together for a celebration of the authors in Medina in person and get to have books signed and everything because we missed oh, that. Oh, that would be lovely. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for asking us. Yeah. Do you have plans to write any more books in the future or just <laughs> needed to tell this story? <laughs> well, you know, I suppose I could write a book about how the book came to be. <laughs> that would be one story to tell. I'm sure there's a lot of interesting stories in that as well, yes, actually. There are. Unfortunately, um, Barbara's memory for events is so much more crisp and accurate than mine. So, you know, I'd have to have her around to do it. So we'll see.
All right. <laughs> well, thank you again very much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us for another Bookends. Very well. Thank you.